civil society is being unraveling. Political life is dysfunctional. Sides are taking up arms. The head of state is accused of power abuse and beheaded. Sides are taking up arms. What a mess. After nine years of civil war, more people had died from the ensuing diseases than had died from armaments. And yet, in the midst of this big mess, a group of believers in 17th century British Isles were utterly convinced that the main purpose of humanity was to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But the question is begged. If you're in, when, when it seems like the world is just falling apart around you, how can you glorify God and enjoy him? An answer to that question struck me square be in, uh, between the eyes when I had the opportunity to serve at Lausanne II Congress on World Evangelization in Manila. We had the opportunity to meet Chen Min Lin. Chen was born to a fairly well-off manufacturing family in Shanghai. He was born again to personal faith in Jesus Christ, his Savior and Lord, when he was 19. He tells of experiencing a call to invest his life in making disciples in a land where the Savior was Chairman Mao. And the Bible? Mao's Red Book. Chen Min Lin pastored three rural churches and in 1968 was arrested the third time for the crime of sharing the good news of Jesus. The outcome of this arrest was 18 years in prison. And while he was in prison, Chen Min Lin's wife died, his son was killed, though the authorities never let him know. He, he tells of observing a number of pastors that had been tortured to death. He himself almost died from starvation in the Shanghai jail. After several years, he was transferred to a prison camp where he was assigned the morbid task of working in the cesspool that collected the human waste of 60,000 prisoners. And as he stepped down into that stench, that putrid waste of uh, that sort of a disease-laden soup, a smile broke out on his face. He was thinking, this is the first time since I've been in prison that I'm alone. The stench had kept the guards away. And he broke out in song. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He told how, as he sang that song, he said, I could feel just being embraced by the Lord in his everlasting arms. He said, it's easy to praise God when we're free. But it's when life gets miserable, that's when the challenge comes. Chen Min Lin learned in really some rather miserable conditions in life what it meant to enjoy God and to glorify God at, at great cost. Well, how do we do that in the world in which we live? I'd like to unpack this idea a little bit more as we go to another part of the world, uh, the Middle East. Now, I'm not talking about the current Middle East. The, current, the Middle East in the Bronze Age experienced uh, its share of chaos. Uh, City-states, tribal confederations, really multinational empires tangled with each other as they came and went. In the midst of that, I'd like to introduce you to another person, Enidwana. You maybe haven't heard of her name. Enidwana was born to Sargon, the king of Akkad, in about 2250 BC. Now, this princess happened also to be a high priest of the moon god, Nana. And another interesting little known fact is that 
She's one of the earliest authors we know by name because of temple hymns that she wrote and uh, devotional that she wrote to the Sumerian god of fertility and love, Inanna, the queen of heaven. In any Dwana's world, they understood that the world was controlled by 60 times 60 gods. Do the math. They also understand that humans were created from the corpse and the blood of a slain god. And humans were created in order to do work that the gods didn't want to do. That's part of the context that uh, they, they, they understood. And Genesis pushes back against this worldview and argues that indeed, in the beginning, not do we have 3,600 gods controlling everything that you think and do and make, not 3,600, but in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. God was before anything. God created all things. He was not created by or out of the things that existed. And God created Adam. God created man in his own image. An amazing uh, turnabout in terms of why man was created. Man was not created as an afterthought. Man was not created to try to, you know, do the work that the gods didn't want to, 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 to be bothered with. Indeed, man was created in God's own image and given dominion and, and commissioned to steward God's good creation. We see documents like uh, the, uh, the Eridu Genesis, uh, the Atrahasis epic, the, uh, the Gilgamesh epic, these stories giving us this kind of background as to what's, what, how they understood the world worked. As people were created, again, just to appease the gods and, uh, and to serve these gods that were, that were capricious. These 3,600 gods that I mentioned, uh, they were, uh, many of them were created by other gods copulating with each other. Uh, the gods would prank each other. The gods would uh, terrorize each other. At times, the gods, when they wanted to get really creative, would uh, kill each other. Like when Tiamat was beaten to a pulp and her body was bisected in order to create heaven and earth. That's a very different picture, a very different sense of economy from what the Bible gives us uh, uh, to understand in terms of our, uh, our, our work. The other thing that we see from the ancient Near Eastern text is they, they recognized that what they were doing was really out of order. Some of these texts uh, tell about this, the, uh, their, their understanding of creating gods uh, in their own image. These craftsmen would uh, carve statues. Uh, and rather than God creating man, man was creating a god. And uh, these texts tell about the, 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 the challenge that they face in trying to understand how do you take a dead god, this statue, and, uh, and, and put it into a temple. There was a ceremony. These texts actually articulate a ceremony where when the craftsmen created this god, they would bring it into a sacred garden, and uh, there was a transition ceremony with very specific incantations that they would uh, uh, recite in order to bring this god about. And part of the text uh, talks about the fact that this statue cannot smell incense. This statue cannot drink or eat without opening the mouth. And you think, well, duh, I can't drink or op eat without opening my mouth either. But hold on, the text goes on to talk about this in this incantation that, uh, that this opening of the mouth, this mispee, the washing of the mouth and the opening of the mouth was the kind of language that was used of midwives when they would clear the airway of uh, a newborn infant to make it breathe. What, what's being depicted here is a ritual to take this dead statue and to try to vivify it, to make it come alive so that it could be properly installed in a, in a temple. On the other hand, when you look at the biblical record, you see the God of heaven 
creating an image, creating man, humanity in his image with his hands and breathing into this image the breath of life, making his image alive. And, and, and then taking this image of God and placing it in the garden to the east of Eden, this temple, this place where God dwells with humankind. A radical difference. This is the kind of thing that gives the basis of the sanctity of human life. Back to the, uh, to, to, to the biblical record, when God creates humankind, he puts us in the garden, he, 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 he creates humanity as sort of the, the, uh, the, the epitome of his creation and commissions him, gives him dominion and commissions him to steward God's good creation. So when we come to look at our work opportunities, Pastor Chen, shoveling sewage, can I do that as an act of worship? Can I do that in a way that honors God? Pastor Chen learned how to do that. He learned that we don't get our dignity from our work. We bring dignity to our work. And I pray that uh, these insights from Scripture in context will help us to see how we can face work even in difficult times when we're working in a, in a messy situation, uh, in a desperate situation, that indeed God is with us. God has created us to serve him, to enjoy him, and to glorify him. May it be so.